Hi everyone, here's the Bechemist once again. Today I'm reviewing High Fidelity by Nick Hornby. For the longest time I was convinced that Nick Hornby was actually a writer of soppy, sentimental, commercial novels. It was recently pointed out to me that I was probably thinking of Nicholas Sparks all along. Then a couple years back I um, saw him talk, uh, Hornby not Sparks, I saw him talk at an event and he had so many interesting opinions on literature and music and it sounded like a fascinating guy and the kind of guy whose books I might like to check out and eventually I did read High Fidelity and oh my god, High Fidelity deals with a certain kind of person, a certain kind of man, admittedly through the narrator's perspective, although I am positive many women out there will also relate to some of the features of this protagonist. The, the book deals with a certain kind of person who navigates the world and thinks of, the, of their emotions and their experiences through their passion slash obsession for a certain form of art. In the book it's music, the protagonist owns a record store, and the book is very much about being a passionate fan of popular music, jazz, um, contemporary music for lack of a better umbrella term, uh, and it deals with what we do when we go to record stores and you might if you, I, I, I am a, a huge music nerd if you also are you will find um, some interesting parallels with your own life maybe in the way uh, the, for instance in the way the narrator describes the feeling you get when you're looking at the store in a record uh, a record shop and maybe you select a certain a record that you don't necessarily love but it's quite cheap and if at the end of the day you haven't found anything else you'll buy that one so that you won't feel like you've wasted an afternoon of your life and with so many other things that pass through your mind as we go about cultivating our obsessions but admittedly uh, the um, many of the reflections in here could as easily be translated to other art forms I think I think there are many movie fans, film fans, who act and behave in exactly the same way for whatever reason that I'm not necessarily going into in the course of the video. I don't think bookish people behave the same. In my experience, huge book nerds tend to be either writers themselves or aspiring writers which complicates things a little bit, but still, high fidelity deals with what it means and the consequences of thinking of, of living life at a higher pitch because you're in constant communication with all of these art forms, with all of these um, artworks that are about emotions and that are about extreme emotions usually, are about tormented love, are about uh, pure blissful love that just transfigures you and changes your life forever and how this maybe mess you up in your approach to relationships and to, to life in general, how it might influence the, um, the way you behave and the way you expect your life to turn out. In one of the most memorable reflections in the novel, the main character reflects on how many people are scared of violence in video games and movies and believe that that stuff's going to turn our kids' brains into mush. But, that's, but for whatever reason, nobody is really afraid of how pop music changes our beliefs about how love is supposed to play out and in, in many ways mess you up and makes you unable to relate to love and to experience love in a natural harmonious way and of course there's no need for me to spell it out that's a provocation but at the same time it's one of the most enduring themes in literature this idea of how our passions how our escapist pursuits how our relationship with art changes our perspective with the world and potentially drives us a tiny bit crazy it's Don Quixote all over again that take I just mentioned on the sinister effects of pop music is just one of the narrator slash protagonist many unforgettable reflections and the narrator is probably well definitely high fidelity's greatest achievement and my question for you if you've read the novel is how did you feel about the narrator because I think I think the novel, the way I see it, is that it pulls a reverted Oscar Wow. Uh, the Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow is one of my very favorite novels of all times. And what happens here is that you have a narrator who behaves horribly toward the people who are close to him. 
and acts in very unfair ways to his friends and to his girlfriend throughout the book, but because he is um, in some ways likable, because he um, has uh, strong opinions on certain topics, um, certain ideas that are easy to hate, say he is uh, very vocal about the crimes of the Trujillo dictatorship in Santo Domingo, and because he is the person who's giving you this story, it's easy at times to root for him and to take his side in the course of the book. Whereas one of the points, one of the, if, if you like allow me the term, of Oscar Wilde, uh, one of the things that the book tries to show uh, you as you read it, especially if you listen to the author's opinion, to Diaz's opinion, is that uh, the narrator, for all that he acts as if he is superior to this Trillo dictatorship, he is just Trillo, he is just a dictator with a different mask. He just commits the same kind of crimes and acts in the same kind of arrogant, possessive ways as the people he is criticizing. All of that big uh, parenthesis to say that High Fidelity kind of does the opposite. High Fidelity kind of tries very hard to convince you that the narrator is a dick and a hopeful person. Whereas when you take a step back and when you look at the bigger picture, I think he kind of isn't. I think he is simply a very believable man and person. That, by the way, is not to excuse his behavior in the course of the novel. At several points across it, he acts horribly, borderline criminally towards certain people, and he does have some relatively douchey opinions. But at the same time, I do believe that, possibly because of like the usual British self-deprecation, the protagonist d works very well toward um, building an image of himself and presenting himself as much less likable than he might actually be. I'm very curious to hear what you thought about him, because I can see very easily how certain people might detest the narrator and protagonist in high fidelity. But part of the reason, and here we touch on one of the most beautiful and striking things about high fidelity, one of the reasons why he appears unlikable in so many ways is that the novel touches upon the most morbid, the most terrible and sad and depressing and agonizing moments in the life of a relationship between two people who are in love or still decide to live life together and to build a relationship together. It deals with the grit that accumulates through years of life together, with the awful thing people who are supposedly in love with one another end up doing to one another. It deals with the same sorts of stuff that writers such as Jonathan Franzen do, uh, or John Updike, say, but when Franzen deals with these topics, he turns them into tragedy, he turns them into these epic things that are supposed to destroy you and to appear as the festering underbelly of uh, everyday life, whereas Horby is just, well, yeah, those things happen. He almost tries to have a laugh at them while still acknowledging how serious it all is and how devastating for the characters. It's a much more lighthearted but much more lucid approach that might make the book appear lighter than it is. In, in fact, this book deals with pretty dark themes. It's the same problem my good friend Michael Chabon possibly my favorite writer, has, that his books, I firmly believe, are so entertaining and so beautiful to experience that sometimes you miss how actually very powerful and impactful they are. Narratively speaking, High Fidelity is beautiful, it alternates between slower brooding chapters where you get these reflections on life and uh, art and music, uh, and popular culture and everything from the protagonist with chapters where the plot moves forward, where you get more of a sense of its life, how it's lived, what his record shop is like, who his friends ha are. Um, this al uh, it alternates between these different perspectives and paces and for that reason it's always addictive and you always end the chapter feeling like reading the first paragraph of the next one and why not the entire thing and why not the entire novel. One of my favorite things when it comes to its narrative structure, I'll have to talk in a second after I warn you that 
I'm going to spoil you, not the plot of course, but maybe part of the structure of the book. So if you don't want to hear any spoiler whatsoever, I highly recommend you stop here. And oh my god, read High Fidelity. I loved it. I was so shocked by how great this book is. And I've only finished, a, finished it a few days ago and it's still fresh in my mind. And I'm still thinking about many of its points, many of its reflections, and I'll pro and I, I keep finding new ways uh, to think about what I've just read about the story of these people and this protagonist in particular. A very um, strong suggestion, do not watch the movie. I never watch uh, a book's movie version before I read it. For whatever reason I did it this time, at least I watched like half of the movie. And it's not even that it's a bad movie, the point is that it's so faithful to the book that many of the unforgettable reflections you find in the book are actually lines in the movie. Um, I would only watch it after you've read the whole thing, you're going to spoil you the such a beautiful reading experience. Moving on to the spoilery bit, my possibly my favorite thing about the narrative structure of I Fidelity is its ending. It has a very non-canonical ending for what at the end of the day is kind of a love story. You don't finish the book with the protagonist getting back together. That actually kind of happens two-thirds of the way in, a little bit later maybe, but you still get quite a long section after that's happened. And that is beautiful because what happens very often with these kinds of stories is that you get a, um, a finale that implies that everything is going to be, you know, they'll, they'll live happily ever after, but that's very unrealistic and it's not the way life works at all. Instead, what happens in I Fidelity is that you get the reunion and then you get a realistic way for the protagonist to change his perspective on life. Everything that's happened to him gives him a new perspective and you, you experience the way he changes and grows up in the in the most edifying of ways, in some bizarre ways. This is not a Bildungsroman, because a Bildungsroman is a very specific thing and it's a very in, um, inflation term, everybody uses it, most people use it wrong, but it is a novel of formation, a novel about a, a teenager becoming an adult, except that the teenager is 36 in the course of the book. The way the book ends, the final reflection, the moment where the character understands that sometimes making a tape for somebody doesn't mean pushing onto them your favorite artist just because you think they're superior, but it means doing something for them that they are going to appreciate and enjoy. That's a hell of a good way to finish a book and to show the character's evolution in ways that are relevant to the book's themes, that relate to everything that's happened to him, to the protagonist, and to the broader discussion on popular music. My god, what a narrative feat. It's actually a jewel of a novel. I loved High Fidelity. I'm very curious to hear what you thought about the book. I'm also very curious to read more of Nick Hornby. Maybe not immediately because I have um, some stuff lined up, but I will definitely check out more of his novels. So if you have any strong suggestion, I'm very curious about those too. Thank you as always for watching the review, guys. Bye, guys.